Welcome to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. My name is Tom Press, and I'll be hosting the program for this evening, two hours. The first hour will be a continuation of our reading of the book, Romanism and the Reformation, by Henry Grattan Guinness. And then at the end of an hour of reading, I'll take a short break, and we'll come back and have some discussion from the listeners. As is my custom... For technical reasons, I usually begin the broadcast by rereading the last paragraph that I read on the previous program as to start. And I do this for continuity purposes, not to be redundant. But this evening, the, the last paragraph that I read last week happens to be three pages long. And it's very important information. That's why I'm going to read it over again. But before I do... I want to remind you that the last paragraph that I read last week had to do with the Holy Roman Inquisition, something that Christians are sorely lacking in knowledge about these days. It's been purposely hidden from us. Now, some of you might remember in school days, or maybe even in church days long ago when you were children, some of you older listeners, my recall mention of how the pagan Roman Empire, that is, when Rome, the Roman Empire was controlled by the pagan Caesars, how they would persecute God's people, the first century Christians, for sport. They would literally throw them to lions in the Colosseums of Rome for entertainment and also to make mockery of the biblical account of Daniel in the lion's den. They were persecuting the spiritual descendants of Daniel, the prophet, by throwing them to be devoured by lions, to be torn in pieces and fed like beef 
to hungry lions in the Colosseum. That's what they thought of Christianity. That's what they thought of Daniel's prophecy. While God spared Daniel in the lion's den, the Caesars made lion food of Christians. Rome doesn't mind us talking about those days. Rome, the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy, doesn't mind at all if we recall that history of how the pagan Roman Empire, before Christianity, quote-unquote, had become the religion of the Roman Empire, how those pagan Roman emperors, those pagan Roman Caesars, made sport, brutal, bloody sport of God's people. But we dare say nothing about what transpired after the pagan Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire under the papal Caesars. And I want to tell you what our history books exclude. They exclude the facts, the guttural, hideous facts that Henry Grattan Guinness is about to reveal to us. True history. Not about the pagan Roman Empire, but about the papal Roman Empire. You see, the popes persecuted God's people so relentlessly for so many centuries and in such torturous means and methods that it would literally shame the Caesars of the pagan Roman Empire for brutality. That we're not allowed to talk about, not in our generation. It's called anti-Roman Catholic bigotry. But the truth is still the truth, no matter what they call it. And it's a truth that is so sorely lacking in our understanding today. History that has been hidden from us that makes all the difference. Now, nothing paints the Roman Catholic Church as the synagogue of Satan, nor the popes as the little horn of Daniel, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of the scripture, than a description of the holy Roman Inquisition. Nothing identifies Rome of what she is historically and biblically and prophetically accused than a full knowledge of the Holy Roman Inquisitions that literally dwarfed any persecution that the pagan Caesars ever levied against Christians. And Henry Grattan Guinness personally went to those places where the most gross persecution of Christians occurred. He stood on that soil. He sifted through the ashes. He saw the bones. He even collected some of those bones to show to the listeners of this particular lecture. And this is the recording, written recording in this book of what he said after he made his presentation about the inquisitions in front of his listeners. I'll begin at the middle of page 174 in the book, Romanism and the Reformation, and then we'll continue where we left off last weekend. Okay, he says, in the middle of page 174, he says, hear me, though in truth I scarcely know how to speak upon this subject. I am almost dumb with horror when I think of it. I have visited the places in Spain, in France, in Italy, most deeply stained and dyed with martyr blood. I have visited the valleys of Piedmont. I have stood in the shadow of the great cathedral of Seville on the spot where they burned the martyrs or tore them limb from limb. There was nothing in your history books about that, was there? The Holy Roman Empire tore 
Bible-believing Christians, limb from limb. He says, I have stood breast deep in the ashes of the martyrs of Madrid. I have read the story of Rome's deeds. I have waded through many volumes of history and of martyrology. I have visited either in travel or in thought scenes too numerous for me to name where the saints of God have been slaughtered by papal Rome, that great butcher of bodies and souls. I cannot tell you what I've seen, what I've read, and what I've thought. I cannot tell you what I feel. Oh, it is a bloody tale. I have stood in that valley of Lucerna, where dwelt the faithful Waldenses, those ancient Protestants who held to the pure gospel all through the dark ages. That lovely valley with its pine-clad slopes, which Rome converted into a slaughterhouse. Oh, horrible massacres of gentle, unoffending, noble-minded men. Oh, horrible massacres of tender women and helpless children. Yes, ye hated them. Ye hunted them. Ye trapped them. Ye tortured them. Ye stabbed them. Ye stuck them on spits. Ye impaled them. Ye hanged them. Ye roasted them. Ye flayed them. Ye cut them in pieces. Ye violated them. Ye violated the women. Ye violated the children. Ye forced flints into them and stakes and stuffed them with gunpowder and blew them up. Tore them asunder limb from limb and tossed them over precipices and dashed them against the rocks. Ye cut them up alive. Ye dismembered them. Ye racked, mutilated, burned, tortured, mangled, massacred, holy men, sainted women, mothers, daughters, tender children, harmless babes, hundreds, thousands, thousands upon thousands. Ye sacrificed them in heaps, in hecatombs, turning all Spain, Italy, France, Europe, Christian Europe, into a slaughterhouse, a carnal house, an acodama. Oh, horrible, too horrible to think of. The sight dims, the heart sickens, the soul is stunned in the presence of the awful spectacle. Oh, harlot, ye gilded harlot with brazen brow and brazen heart. Red are thy garments, red thine hands. Thy name is written in this book. God has written it. The world has read it. Thanks to the Protestant Reformation, the world has read it. Thou art a murderess, O Rome. Thou art the murderous Babylon, Babylon the Great, drunken, foully drunken, yea, drunken with the sacred blood which thou hast shed in streams and torrents, the blood of saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Were there nothing else by which to recognize thee, O persecuting church of Rome? This dreadful mark would identify thee. This is thy brand. By this we know thee. Thou art that foretold Babylon. We know thee by thy place. We know thee by thy proud assumptions by the throne on which thou sittest, by those seven hills, by the beast thou ridest, by the garments thou wearest, 
by the cup thou bearest, by the name blazoned on thy forehead, by thy kingly paramours, by thy shameless looks, by thy polluted deeds, but, oh, chiefly by this, by thy prolonged and dreadful persecution of the saints, by those massacres, by that inquisition, by the fires of that burning stake, Mark how its ruddy flames ascend. See how its accusing smoke goes up to heaven. In this sacred prophecy, behold thy picture. Read thy name. Read, a read thy written doom. The French Revolution broke upon thee. It was a stage, just a stage in thy judgment and no more. The beast who carried thee for centuries in abject submission turned against thee, cast thee off, stripped thy garments from thee, and rent thee with its horns. It was foretold it would be so. It is fulfilled. But that fulfillment is not the end. It is but the beginning of the end. Tremble, for thy doom is written from of old. The hand upon the wall has written it. The finger of Almighty God has engraved it. Dreadful have been thy sins. Dreadful shall be thy punishment. Thou hast burned alive myriads of the members of Christ. Thou hast burned them to cinders and to ashes. Thy doom, thy doom is to be burned. Thy doom is the appalling flame whose smoke ascends forever. I have done. Prophecy has spoken. History has fulfilled its utterance. Rome pagan ran its course. Rome papal took its place. Babylon the Great has risen, has risen, has reigned, and has fallen. Her end is nigh. Come out of her, my people. Come out of her before the final judgment act in the great drama of the apostasy. Come out of her, saith the Lord God, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. For as a millstone cast by a mighty angel into the sounding deep, she shall with violence be thrown down and shall be found no more forever. God add his blessing to the reading of his own truth in Henry Grattan Guinness's book, Romanism and the Reformation, and stop and listen to the words that Henry Grattan Guinness used, words that you can hardly utter with the full comprehension of the meaning with which Henry Grattan Guinness places upon them. These were historical acts. No exaggeration whatsoever. As a matter of fact, if you read the accounts of the Holy Roman Inquisition, as it was called, when they thought burning God's people was an act of service to God, you'll find that he's glossed over much of it. There's much that occurred during the Inquisitions that one cannot even repeat in mixed company. Rome pagan, when it came to persecuting God's people, was a piker compared to the Holy Roman Inquisitions. The Holy Roman Inquisitions dwarfed all of the horrors of the Caesars. But you won't read about it in any history book. Not in the schools today. You won't hear about it in the churches today. It's not politically correct. No, we don't want to tell the truth about Rome. Because, well, that too is prophecy being fulfilled. Blindness and apostasy 
and ignorance and denial. But those who have courage, courage given by God alone, can comprehend this, can take it to heart and heed the warning that Henry Grattan Guinness has given us. Now stop and ask yourself, if you now have, for the first time in your life, some concept of the bloodbath called the Holy Roman Inquisition, ask yourself, would God want any of his people any of his people to seek peace and unity with that bloody persecutor in Rome? Would God want an ecumenical Christian reunion with that bloody church of Rome? But that's where the world's heading. And those of us who protest the ecumenical movement are labeled haters and religious fanatics and radical fundamentalists. They demonized us. And because the world is ignorant of Rome's history, the label sticks. The only way to beat the deception is to throw the covers off of the truth. And that's what Henry Grattan Guinness is doing in this book. Throwing the cloak of concealment off of the whore of Rome and exposing her hideous role in history, her prophetic role in history. And we should not be ashamed nor hindered from that endeavor not if we truly love God's people and hope to save them from the great apostasy, Babylon the Great, that has overtaken what was once called the Protestant churches. Now that concluded Lecture 4. We'll continue now with Lecture 5 in the book Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness. It's entitled Interpretation and Use of These Prophecies in Pre-Reformation Times. We're going to examine how the Protestant Reformers or those Christians who lived even before the Protestant Reformation read the prophecies of the Bible and how they applied them and what they believed about them. He begins this lecture... Romanism foretold, such has been our subject in the four previous lectures, the scripture prophecy and the papal history, that a deep and widespread apostasy has taken place in the Christian church, that this apostasy has produced paganized forms of Christianity, the chief of which is that of the Romish church, the Roman Catholic church, that the apostasy of the Romish church has culminated in the papacy, that the papacy has lasted through long centuries and lords it over half of Christendom, that it has persecuted the faithful unto blood, striving for the destruction of the gospel of God as if it were deadly heresy and for the extermination of the saints of God as of accursed heretics, that it would have been completely triumphant still, but for the glorious Protestant Reformation, which burst its bonds, emancipated the enslaved consciences of millions, and created a new departure in the convictions and actions of the world. Such are the facts with which history presents us. They are broad, unquestionable facts, which are so notorious as to be beyond all controversy, so long-lasting as to fill the records of a thousand years. And that this great apostasy was foretold 
that it was foretold ages before its accomplishment by Old Testament prophets and New Testament apostles, that Daniel, dwelling in Babylon, foretold it, and John, the exile on Patmos, and Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, that these men, surrounded as they were by ancient heathenism, and knowing nothing by the evidence of their senses or by observation of the complete corruption of Christianity, which has since darkened the world, as a long and awful eclipse of the Son of Righteousness, these men, prophets and apostles, living in antecedent times, should have predicted the extraordinary events which have come to pass and should have painted them in vivid colors on the venerable pages of the writings they have left us, and that those predictions have for 18 centuries confronted apostate Christendom with their accusations and reflected as in a faithful mirror the entire history of its ways. This is the profound prophetic truth we have endeavored to elucidate. We have now to study the interpretation and use of these marvelous prophecies by the Christian church. How has the Christian church understood and employed them? Of what practical benefit have these prophecies been to her during the last 18 centuries? It is evident that they were written for her guidance, her protection, and her sanctification. The prophecies of Paul and John are addressed to the Christian churches. The voice of inspiration expressly invites the whole church to study them, and the church has obeyed this command. She has read, marked, learned, and inwardly digested the sure word of prophecy. What moral effect has it had upon prophecy or upon, upon the church? To what extent has it guided her footsteps and sustained her hopes? If these prophecies have proved to be a mighty power in her history, if they have preserved the faith of the church in times of general apostasy, if they have given birth to great Reformation movements, if they have inspired confessors and supported martyrs at the stake, if they have broken the chains of priestcraft, superstition, and tyranny, and produced at last a return on the part of many millions of men to a pure, primitive Christianity, they have answered their purpose and justified their position in the sacred scriptures of truth. Nor may we lightly esteem that interpretation which has produced such results. Had the prophecies been misinterpreted, applied otherwise than according to the mind of the Spirit of God, we cannot believe that they would have been thus productive of blessed consequences. The fact that, understood and applied as they were by the Reformers, they have produced spiritual and eternal good to myriads of mankind as a proof that they were rightly applied for, quote, by their fruits ye shall know them, unquote, is true not only of teachers, but of their teachings. Protestantism, with all its untold blessings, is the fruit of the historic system, the historic system of interpretation. Now let me mark right here on page 182 in the middle of the page, Henry Grattan Guinness launches his first direct assault upon Futurism, the idea that Antichrist doesn't rear his diabolical head until just before Christ returns. Listen again carefully to what Henry Grattan Guinness says. Protestantism, with all its untold blessings, is the fruit of the historic system of interpretation. Clearly, Henry Grattan Guinness is calling himself as did all previous Christians, real, true, Bible-believing Christians, called themselves historicists. 
they believed in the historical Antichrist, the one prophesied in the Bible, the one Paul spoke of as the man of sin who would rise to power as soon as the restrainer was taking, taken out of the way. And he was speaking of none other than pagan Rome, the Rome of the pagan Roman Empire that was ro- ruled by the Caesars. And as soon as that old pagan Roman Empire collapsed, as soon as the Caesars ceased to rule Rome, that man of sin would be revealed, and he was. It's called the man of sin, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of the Bible, the papacy. And all Christians throughout history up until the late 1800s never once heard the word futurism. They all agreed that the papacy fulfilled most magnificently, most perfectly, and most completely the role of Antichrist in the world. And to teach them, if they were to hear what we believe today in the Christian churches about a future Antichrist, they would literally be stunned for the kind of ignorance that has fallen upon God's people since the Protestant Reformation. We must repent of futurism. We must return to an historical understanding of the papacy and its role in history as the Antichrist prophesied in the Bible. And if we don't, we stand very well to be deceived by a counterfeit Antichrist that the papacy wants to put forward to deceive the whole world. Let me just tell you, whoever Rome selects after generations, probably three generations of American Christians being told of a future Antichrist and how he will sign a peace treaty with the Jews, and three and a half years after the peace treaty is signed, he will reevaluate the peace treaty and cause the sacrifices and oblations of the Jews to cease. That's all a lie. But whoever the papacy puts forward to fulfill that prophetic role, that counter-prophetic role, will be marked as the Antichrist of the Bible by Christians all over the world, and you won't be able to convince them otherwise. Now is the time to correct the error. It was Jesus after three and a half years of his ministry, the 70th week of Daniel, who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by sacrificing himself on the cross, that we might be found righteous in him. There is no more sacrifice for sin. Salvation is by Christ, the Lamb of God. But Rome wants to refulfill that prophecy in the latter times to deceive the whole world to take the glory away from Christ and put it on someone else. Let us not be deceived any longer by this futurism that is so popular in the churches today. Let us, in the name of Christ, let us return to historic, historicism. Remember that Daniel's prophecy, the 70 weeks of Daniel, was to prophesy the coming of Messiah. It deals with the Messiah and no one but the Messiah. And it was fulfilled just as Daniel wrote it. There's only one brief mention in Daniel's prophecy about the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's in reference to Prince Titus, who was the son of the current reigning Caesar, therefore making him the prince. And in 70 AD, they destroyed the city and the sanctuary, fulfilling that portion of Scripture. But the he immediately spoken of in Daniel 9.27 uh, 9, is speaking of Messiah. And history, as recorded in the Bible, the most accurate source of history available to mankind today, proves that it was Jesus who fulfilled that 70th and final week And I will give you just one example of many, just one example of many. 
one of the apostles came to Jesus and asked him the question. Now, remember, we're talking about Daniel's 70th week. Seventy times seven. It was divided into three periods. First, 42 weeks, then 60, uh, then 69 weeks, and, and uh, uh, first seven weeks, and then 62 weeks, which makes 69 weeks, and then one week. Okay. That was Jesus' ministry. One week of years, seven years. Now, remember, the apostle came to Jesus and asked him this poignant question. How many times shall I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus poignantly answered in a prophetic way. And in this way, proclaimed himself as the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. He said, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven times. Do you understand what what Jesus did when he answered that question? He literally proclaimed that it was the 70th week of Daniel that he was the prophesied Messiah, and that he was forgiving his brethren unto 70 times, seven times. But if they did not confess their sins, if they did not accept him as Messiah, that was the end. And that, too, is prophesied in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Remember, the prophecy was about Daniel's people and Jerusalem. And in the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifice and oblations to cease, just as Daniel prophesied. And for the remaining three and a half years, through his Holy Spirit, and the the, those who walked in the light of life, continued to confirm the covenant in his blood with the Jews. And at the end of that last three and a half years, completely fulfilling all 490 years, completely bringing an end to the last and 70th week of that prophecy, Stephen finally convinced the Sanhedrin that they had wickedly slain their own Messiah. And instead of getting on their knees and confessing it and asking forgiveness and leading all Israel to accept Christ as their Messiah, They stoned Stephen to shut him up. And that is when the gospel went to the Gentiles. Daniel's prophecy was closed. And not long after that, the pagan Roman Empire dissolved. And what stood up in its place is what we know of today as papal Rome and the persecution of God's saints that's the historical interpretation of the prophecies. You've heard me. Now let's listen more to Henry Grattan Guinness. He says, on the other hand, all that leads us to expect that the sufferers under anti-Christian tyranny would correctly interpret the prophetic word written for their guidance and support. And support prompts also the expectation that their persecutors would just as surely wrongly interpret it. Now, look, what Henry Grattan Guinness is trying to tell you is God's spirit-filled people will understand the prophecies. Those for whom the prophecies identify as the Antichrist will not understand the prophecies, will wrongly interpret the prophecies. Listen, this, is, this has occurred in history. The, if it is true, as I assert, and as does Henry Grattan Guinness and all the Protestant reformers, that the Antichrist is the, the papacy, we dare not assume that the papacy is going to acknowledge that, but rather is going to teach something else either preterism or futurism. You can believe in a past antichrist, as in 
Caesars, uh, one of the pagan Caesars, or you can believe in a future Antichrist that doesn't come just before Christ returns. But you cannot believe that the Pope is the Antichrist. See, that's what Rome teaches. That's what Rome has always taught. She's taught that the papacy is not the Antichrist. Like the Protestant reformers said, like the Bible says, it's not the papacy. The papacy is the vicar of Christ. The Roman Catholic Church is the body of Christ. That's what Rome teaches. She can never... In cor- she can never correctly interpret the prophecies without condemning herself. So she teaches preterism or futurism. The truth is in historicism. And what I want to do now is to enlighten my listeners to understand that what the churches teach and believe today called futurism Rome has always believed and taught. It's Roman in origin. It comes from the Jesuit order. It comes from the quote-unquote fathers of the Roman Catholic Church who could not see in the papacy the fulfillment of those prophecies. They interpreted the prophecies a different way as to exonerate the papacy. And one of those was futurism, the idea that the Antichrist wouldn't come until the last seven years. Rome has always taught this to her parishioners. And now it's believed and taught in the Protestant churches, thus destroying Protestantism altogether. Listen again. Henry Grattan Guinness says, on the other hand, all that leads us to expect that the sufferers under anti-Christian tyranny, under papal tyranny, would correctly interpret the prophetic word written for their guidance and support prompts also the expectation that their persecutors, the popes and the, and the Roman Catholic Church, their persecutors would just as assuredly wrongly interpret it. Rome has always wrongly interpreted the, Protestant, or the, the prophecies regarding Antichrist. Common sense dictates that. And it's also common sense dictates that the true believers in Jesus Christ correctly interpreted the prophecies. And who did they apply those prophecies to? None other. None other than the popes of Rome. He continues, as apostate Jews wrongly interpreted the prophecies of the Old Testament, so we should expect apostate Christians wrongly to interpret those of the new. In our study of the last 18 centuries of interpretation, we shall not expect to find the true interpretation, therefore, among the apostates, but among the faithful, not among the persecutors, but among the persecuted not among those who have waged war against the gospel of Christ, but among those who have confessed its pure teachings and sealed that confession with their own blood. We shall not expect to, we shall not be surprised to find antagonistic schools of prophetic interpretation, but on the contrary, we shall expect such and we shall expect the apostates and the persecutors to belong to one school and the faithful confessors and martyrs to belong to another. If the officer of justice arrests a man because he perceives that he answers exactly to the description of a notorious criminal published by the government as a help to his identification, Is it likely that the man himself will admit that the description fits him? He will, of course, deny the correspondence, but his denial will carry no weight. On turning to the history of prophetic interpretation, this is precisely what we find. With many varieties as to detail, we find there have existed and still exist two great opposite schools of interpretation, the papal and the Protestant, or the futurists and the historical. 
There you have it in clear terms, terms that I have used repeatedly. Henry Grattan Guinness gives you those two opposing schools of interpretation of Bible prophecy, the papal, which is futurist, and the Protestant, which is historicist. So which do you believe? Do you believe the papal, futurism, that the Antichrist is not the papacy of history, that Daniel was wrong, that Paul was wrong, that John was wrong, that history was misunderstood by generations, 18 generations of Bible-believing Christians who shed their blood from every coast, and that the Antichrist is a single individual that comes just before Christ's return, almost an afterthought of history, insignificant. And that we not need we need not fear Antichrist. We not we need not even look for his coming because we're probably going to die before this futurist phony arrives. Or we could be quote unquote raptured before his appearance on the world stage. So let's unite with the papacy and unite all Christians together. You see how great and grand the apostasy, and the delusion of futurism is today. The whole world wonders after the beast. The whole world wishes to unite under papal tyranny once again, having forgotten every drop of blood that was spilled by the tens and hundreds of millions of Christians throughout those last 18 centuries. Not to even mention those who were persecuted relentlessly under the Caesars. Futurism makes a mockery of every drop of blood that was shed in Christ's name for martyrs. True Bible-believing Christians, futurism makes a mockery of Protestantism and the truth. Futurism makes a mockery of God's holy word, turning prophecies into fables. Futurism makes a mockery of the mentality of God's people, reducing us to blithering idiots believing lies and fables. What are we we going to do? Are we going to continue to support these futurist churches or to expose them for the deceivers they are? Are we going to continue under this grand delusion in the name of peace and unity when there is no peace and there is no unity with Antichrist? Will we remain silent or will we speak out at the top of our lungs? Anybody will listen. On turning to the history of prophetic interpretation, this is precisely what we find. With many varieties as to detail, we find there have existed and still exist two great opposite schools of interpretation, the papal and the Protestant, or the futurist and the historical. The latter regards the prophecies of Daniel, Paul, and John as fully and faithfully setting forth the entire course of Christian history. The former as dealing chiefly with a future fragment of time at its close. The former or futurist system of interpreting the prophecies is now held strangely to say by many Protestants but it was first invented by the Jesuit Ribera at the end of the 16th century to believe the papacy, or rather to relieve the papacy from the terrible stigma cast upon it by the Protestant interpretation. 
This interpretation was so evidently the true and intended one that the adherents of the papacy felt its edge must at any cost be turned or blunted. If the papacy were the predicted Antichrist, as Protestants asserted, there was an end of the question, and separation from it became an imperative duty. There were only two alternatives. If the Antichrist were not a present power, he must be either a past or a future one. Some writers asserted that the predictions pointed back to Nero. This did not take into account the obvious fact that the anti-Christian power predicted was to succeed the fall of the Caesars and develop among the Gothic nations. The other alternative became, therefore, the popular one with papists. Did you hear what he said? Listen again. He said the other alternative, that is the futurist alternative, became, therefore, the popular one uh, with, among papists. That is, Roman Catholics. It became the popular one with popes. It became the popular view with cardinals and bishops and archbishops and priests. Futurism is a Roman Catholic teaching, not a Protestant teaching. He says, again, the other alternative became, therefore, the popular one with papists. Okay? The preterist view says that Nero or Caligula or one of the pagan Roman empires was the fulfillment of the prophecies regarding Antichrist. That deceived a few, but even the most popular view, uh, even among Catholics, was the futurist view. And you can ask Protestants on the street, just go down the street, Anybody who calls himself a Protestant or an evangelical or even a Catholic, ask them, which school of interpretation do you believe, the preterist or the futurist? And you'll get a few who will say preterism, but the lion's share will say futurism. Nary a one will say historicism. The Protestant view is historicism. He says, again, there were only two alternatives. If the Antichrist were not a present power, like the papacy, the ongoing papacy, the historical papacy, he must be either a past or a future one. Some writers asserted that the predictions, the prophetic predictions of Antichrist pointed back to Nero. This did not take into account the obvious fact that the anti-Christian power predicted in the Scripture was to succeed the fall of the Caesars and develop among the Gothic nations. The other alternative became, therefore, the popular one with papists. Antichrist was future. So Ribera and Bosuet and others taught. An individual man was intended, they said, not a dynasty. The duration of his power would not be for twelve and a half centuries, but only three and a half years. He would be an open foe to Christ, not a false friend. Let me ask you the question. There's only one other person beside the papacy called the man of sin, or rather the son of perdition in the Bible. Who was it? Those of you who read and study the scriptures, who is referred to specifically in the scriptures with that term? Son of perdition. It was Judas, a false friend, not an open foe. Judas is literally a model for the papacy. If you know anything about the papacy and you know anything about Judas Iscariot, you know that Judas Iscariot was simply a forecast for the papacy. He was never an open foe to Christ. 
but a false friend. It's true. It's the papacy. Roman Catholics believe that an individual man was intended for Antichrist, not a dynasty, as is the papacy. And the duration of this individual man's power would not be for 12 and a half centuries, but only three and a half years. He would be an open foe to Christ, openly in opposition to Christ, not a false friend. He would be a Jew and sit in the Jewish temple. Speculation about the future took the place of study of the past and present, and careful comparison of the facts of history with the predictions of prophecy. Here, Henry Grattan Guinness has reiterated what I've said over and over and over for the last decade or more of talking about these subjects to people, that you cannot understand the prophecies, you cannot fully understand the Bible unless you understand history. And you cannot understand history, you cannot comprehend history unless you understand the Bible. They go hand in hand. Common sense dictates if God prophesies a thing to happen, the only way you can be sure that it has been fulfilled is if you see its perfect fulfillment in history. So all you have to do to blind God's people as to what prophecies are fulfilled and what prophecies aren't is simply blind them to history. And that's what our government has done. That's what the education system in this country has done, has run by our government. That's what our churches have done. That's what our seminaries have done. That's what our seminarians have done. They have blinded us to history. Henry Grattan Guinness opens the pages of true history, written not by the victors over God's people, but the history written by God's people, and it shows a perfect fulfillment of the prophecies of Daniel, Paul, and John. Those histories are not talked about on the mainstream media, in the alternative media, not by our government, not by Congress, not by our presidents, not by our civil courts, not by the Supreme Court, not by our education system. Why? Because they've got an agenda, a new world order, which is simply the mirror image of the old world order that the papacy enjoyed for those 1,800 years. I'm going to say it one more time before we close the broadcast. The new world order is simply the reestablishment of the old world order. And in this book, we'll find out what the new world order is by studying what the old world order was. The world was controlled by the papacy. He picked the kings of the earth, and the kings of the earth did his bidding to the tune of of hundreds of millions of Bible-believing Christians destroyed by any and every bloodthirsty, cruel, and despicable means, that is what the new world order will produce. And all of it is only possible Because God's people, once called Protestant, have given up, surrendered, and forgotten their Protestantism, and have believed a lie, a futurist lie, a lie that exonerates the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, and prepares us to receive him for what he has always called himself, the vicar or the replacement of Christ, when in reality, he is a Judas priest, a counterfeit Christ, a deceiver of the whole world. Give up your futurism. Give up the grand delusion that has destroyed Protestantism and left the world open for papal conquest papal tyranny, papal persecution, 
and the destruction of the word of God among God's people. You think you're being persecuted now? You wait till our government becomes the crusader against God's people today, just like they were during the old world order. <laughs> 